Amanda Diekman is a late diagnosed autistic adult and parent coach in the area of low demand parenting. Known online, especially on Instagram, as low demand Amanda, Amanda promotes a parenting approach of dropping demands and aligning expectations to surround our kids with radical love and acceptance. I am so thrilled to have this conversation. We have not talked about the autistic lived experience here on Keep Calm Mother On. And that's because I've wanted to make sure that I talk to voices that are actually autistic. Let's keep calm and mother on. Mothering is way too important to do alone and way too serious to be serious all the time. My name is Christy Thomas, and I am here shoulder to shoulder with you, mothering and enjoying life together. This is the podcast where you can focus on being mindful and taking a deep breath with me and learning new things so you can pause and savor the amazing life you already have. You're going to want to hop on over to the Low Demand Parenting Summit. Amanda is going to talk about low demand parenting, but she's actually hosting a live summit from March 28th through March 30th. And if you're listening to this in real time, then I don't want you to miss out. You don't have to feel like you're walking on eggshells with parenting. Parenting doesn't have to be impossibly hard. LowDemandParentingSummit.com I welcome you, Amanda. I'm so glad you could be here this morning or yeah, we're recording in the morning, but who knows when you're listening to this. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much. I'm really excited for this conversation. I am always amazed by the cool people I can find on the internet, thanks to social media. And I'm glad you're brave enough to start your low demand Amanda account and to start talking about what life is like for you. And the things that you've done to make it better, more connected, more loving, all of those things, even though life can still be hard. Yeah, that's right. That's what it's all about. It's helping people to access the ease and joy of the low demand life, attuning and aligning with our kids. These are the the core principles of what my life is about and trying to extend them to all the other exhausted, worn out, confused parents who are stumbling through with some really challenging parenting dynamics. So let's talk about the challenging parenting dynamics in your house. First Mm -hmm. of all, we have not talked about the autistic lived experience here on Keep Calm Mother on before, but that is part of your lived experience. So can you tell us about your journey to autism? Absolutely. Uh, I was a sensitive and perfectionist child, and um, I was very singular. Teachers would write letters home to tell my mom just about what I was like in the classroom. We never had a word for my sense of self. Um, I was different, and I felt special. And yet, as I got older into my teen and adult years, I began to mask that special part of me in order to fit in. And it wasn't until I was, first of all, investigating what is autism for my son when he was five years old that I really began to understand not, I wasn't reading for him. I was reading for myself. I couldn't stop investigating autism. And over and over again, I I heard this resonance inside of me. This is me. This is me. And so my son was diagnosed um, at the Duke Autism Center. And three months later, I was diagnosed um, at age 37. So the real gift for me was finding a name and a community of people who have similar lived experiences. It's like being electrified by just the overwhelming sensitivity to all the things in the world and if there's a spectrum of sensitivity, I'm on an extremely <laughs> attuned side and realizing that that comes with a whole host of other challenges that I've faced and, and unmasking those challenges and supporting them rather than shoving them down and pretending 
part of me has been so life-giving. So I'm onward into my next 40 years, ready to be openly autistic and caring for myself in a, a fresh new way. I love that. So was it in your teen years then that it really like you shoved it down? Yeah. Um, middle school and high school became the formation years of what I consider my, my mask. Masking is a term in the autistic community for the pressure to perform like a neurotypical person, regardless of the impact on yourself. And there's some important data about masking and mental health struggles that the major way that autistic girls show up in the system is with being diagnosed with anxiety or depression, harm, eating disorders. And there's a growing movement that we need to look beyond. Those are just the symptoms. We need to look beyond those to the formation of the mask and then what's behind it. What are the the needs? And being a mom and an autistic mom, which is my new, you know, identity, um, there's also, there's a lot of pressure on, on moms and on women not to have needs and not. To have needs. And so to be part of me saying I'm openly autistic mom is saying I have some pretty significant needs for support and I'm okay with that. I'm going to be this kind of person in the world who shows up needy and struggling and also incredibly tuned and and incredibly supportive and connected like th- this is yeah. me <laughs> i love that because i think that there's probably more people out there um that haven't let themselves feel needs in a long time and especially with moms like we blame motherhood but i think if a lot of people were to unpack that there's probably a lot more neurodiversity especially in women that is um diagnosed or mm-hmm. it's lacking diagnosis right like there's a lot of under diagnosed or self diagnosed which is completely valid too from my reading mm-hmm. yeah absolutely women adult women now are able to find other adult women on the internet and find experiences that match up. And they're saying, Oh, I've been ADHD all along. I wasn't broken or messed up or incapable. I have a different brain and same thing with autism and learning differences. It's important to recognize that that also fits within the community of neurodiversity. So somebody who's dyslexic or um, now learning disability in in math, these kinds of struggles that we weren't even adequately named when we were young. No. (laughs) Are now showing up in difficulties in our parenting journeys. And yet this is a a moment with a groundswell of encouragement for people to go ahead and name it and say and, and become a part of this neurodivergent community. So labeling, accepting the label and knowing that this is who you were and that it wasn't a flaw or something that you were drowning under, did that help? It sounds like there's a lot of freedom for you. The the journey has been more complex than that. Okay. The, um, The discovery of our autism, of my son and my own, came in the middle of my middle. So I have three kids, 10, eight, and six now. And my eight-year-old, when he was five, six, was the start of the pandemic and hit the be- was supposed to be the beginning of his kindergarten year, which he'd been looking forward to for years. And when it was online, which was a massive failure for him, and then we tried a couple of other settings and, and we didn't know he was autistic yet, um, there was a lot of pushing him to try this, try this, try this. And then a day came where I was pushing him yet again towards this kindergarten that I wanted to be a fit. It could have been a and something in him broke and he was, he went into autistic burnout, which it was the context for us discovering what is going on. Um, because his behaviors became so extreme that it needed a name. And so for us, the beginning of the journey was in so much pain that we needed a name for the pain. 
what we've come through and where life is now is where the joy is. But I, I just have to say that it wasn't full as, disclosure. Wasn't, yeah. <laughs> um, I was a mom it, loving a child in burnout and then went through my own pretty severe burnout because of the impact of his behaviors on me. And I ended up being diagnosed with PTSD because of just how difficult our home life had become. So the, these under self understandings of myself as mother of mother to an autistic child, autistic mother to an autistic child, it really grows out of my journey of healing of going from this very broken place where nothing that we tried was working. And I knew we needed a new path forward that all the old advice of like, just push, push him through, he'll get over it. Or, um, you know, the, the system works, just stick with it. If you were just consistent enough, this would work out. Yep. If you put boundaries in place, if you held firm, if you, yeah, there, we, there's so much advice about being rigid so that they, they can trust you with your rigidness. Yes. And none of those things worked in burnout because all he could do was get up and eat one food and watch YouTube and drink water and go back to sleep. That was the fullness of his day. And he was, and yet I wanted to create a positive set of expectations for him that he was meeting. So that he would be proud that he was meeting his parents' expectations, that he was doing what we needed for him to do. And so we created a schedule. You get up, <laughs> you eat your crunchy breakfast, you watch your YouTube in your room under a blanket, you eat pretzels, you go to sleep and do it again. And this is what we want for you. And that was really the fertile ground that the low demand parenting approach grew out of was really looking to attune and align my expectations to what this particular child at the very bottom, yeah, <laughs> what, you know, I would right. have dreamed of his life looking like. This was like the very bare Yeah, moment. this is and very that, survival mode. Yes. And yet even there, I could be proud of him for doing those things. And even there, I could let go of everything else and just say, this is enough. And if that's enough, then I don't need to start building a whole other schema of like, well, you to be a good kid, you got to do this, this, this. You got to put your own shoes on and you got to say please and thank you. And so many things. <laughs> yeah, there are so many things. I, when I was reading your book, um, which comes out in July and it's called Low Demand Parenting, right? Yes. Um, I I was reading it and I was like. This is overwhelming to pause and think about all the things we have to do or all the things we have to, in air quotes, do every day in the steps that are required to do something simple like pick breakfast or put on socks and shoes. Um, mm-hmm. Reading your book really opened my eyes to how many steps I take for granted when I do them. Yes. Seeing a child struggle with the very simple executive function and demand avoidance uh, has really helped me to, to develop my compassion for the very many ways that we can show up in the world. And you know, one of the great things about the neurodiversity movement, too, is naming ableism, that ableism is this like other isms it's it's in the water that we drink in the the air that we breathe (laughs) and it says that there's one right way to be a human and beginning to unpack that and and dismantle that in my home Mm -hmm. has meant accepting oh it is just too hard for you to put your own shoes on and that's okay the parts that you're able to do are slide your foot into the shoe and then hold still while I tie it. Mm -hmm. And I can do all the other parts and that's okay. That that's accommodation. It's not coddling. And can you say that one more time? (laughs) 
that's accommodation, <laughs> not traveling. There are so and, many parents that I know, and myself included, that when you do an accommodation and there's extended family watching, especially, they're like, you're doing too much. You're too nice. Like your kid needs to suck it up and do it just like I did. Yes. The suck it up mindset creates adults who don't know how to listen to their own inner voice and who don't have the kind of self-trust and to enforce a, a solid boundary around what's enough and what's too much. Ooh. And that I'm speaking from my own experience. And so he, teaching our children to honor what's too hard for them and to speak up about their needs and to get accommodations is so healing for our inner child that had to suck it up. (laughs) And what if we don't, what kind of world would that be? People ask me all the time, what about the real world when they have a boss? Um, And I say, you know, I'm raising my kids for the world that I want to see. And I'm transforming the world by the way that I raise them. So yeah, I dream of a better future. And that's the world that I want inside my home. I'm not going to put out their light from an early age just so that they're tough enough to withstand the world. Yeah. I want to teach them skills so that they know how to advocate for themselves in the world as it is, mm-hmm. and also that they know what it feels like to be truly safe and accommodated. So low demand parenting means meeting your kid where they are, because I know you've read Ross Green and I've read Ross Green, but he has this great quote of, oh my gosh, do you know what it is? The kids do better or kids do what they kids can. Kids do well when they can. <laughs> right. Kids, kids do, do well, well when, they can. when they can. And and if you can approach a kid with that mindset, a kid that's having a hard time or looking unsuccessful, according to some people, how can we help them do well um, when they can? So low demand parenting really starts with that idea, right? Absolutely. Yes. Ross Green's idea that kids do well when they can also says that it's infinitely preferable to do well rather than not do well, that kids are already internally fully motivated to meet others' expectations. And so we don't need a system of rewards and punishments to make it more pleasant or more painful when they don't meet our expectations. It's all about alignment. And what I love about his approach is this great relationship that it creates between the parent and the child. What the reason that the low demand approach is so needed is that for many of us, we never really get to the, the collaborative problem solving (laughs) part of his. Correct. (laughs) That just letting things go and just attuning and aligning is really where we spend our days Um, If you're familiar with it, it's what they call plan C in that um, if you've read The Explosive Child. And so low demand parenting is really a framework for how to enact a life around attuned and aligned demands. So first, a demand is any ask that you make of another person. And a demand itself is got layers to it. And at the bottom of a demand is always some kind of a need. And so low demand parenting is going straight to the need and looking for how can we meet a need without asking something that's too hard. And another way of putting it is how can I get my adult need met without infringing on my child's boundaries? That's really that complicated. Did it take it you a long time to figure out how to approach situations? Like, I'm sure some mom is like, this sounds good, but I have no clue how to do that. Yeah. Well, we started with breakfast okay? because it was the most explosive time of day. None of us had had our coffee yet. We were just starting and my kid is melting down and it felt like we can solve breakfast. So I wrote down every single difficulty that he was having related to breakfast Well, there is leaving your room, there's um, walking down the stairs, tolerating siblings sitting at the same table, asking for what you want, 
um, watching the milk get poured to the right level, all of these demands that we were making. And those were the things he was melting down over. And so we slowly figured out which of these things are too hard and which of them are okay. And in that process of figuring out breakfast, we were able to get a breakfast routine that was within his zone of tolerance. And it looks like him getting up, coming to the hallway and laying down in a blanket fort that I set up. And um, then I brought him a laminated menu with pictures of our cereal boxes for him to point to the one he wanted. And then I brought him that cereal with the milk already poured in and he would eat it in his blanket fort. That was a breakfast routine that we could do day after day after day and discovering what our life was like without these morning meltdowns. That was life changing. <laughs> so we I started, bet <laughs> we started small and with something that was really impacting the family's quality of life. Mm-hmm. And the crazy thing about, you know, starting small is that it radiated out from there that he had so much confidence that he knew how to order from his menu and that it would arrive just the way that he wanted it, that it built trust where there had been very, very little and meeting his needs in that way. It, it began to spread. We didn't even, you know, I didn't work with him on anything besides breakfast for months, but just nailing that breakfast, man, it, it was transformative. Okay. So here's the devil's advocate question, right? Like, so did his, did his other brothers try to copy this behavior? Did they want the same accommodations? How did you handle that? Cause he's not the only kid in your house. Yeah. What I find with jealousy from kids is that it's revealing a place where things have been too hard for them as well. And they have not had the self-advocacy skills to speak up about it. And so in a way, what they're jealous of is that their brother made a big enough fuss that the adults paid attention and listened and aligned. Yes. And so instead of treating it like jealousy, I treat it like, oh, something's too hard for you. Let's figure out what. It may not be breakfast that's too hard for you. It might be that it's actually for one of my kids, we discovered not the one that needs the blanket for it, a different kid <laughs> that he has misophonia and the sound of chewing is a sensory like nails on a chalkboard for him. And so we discovered that he needs to eat with headphones on in order to block out the sound of us chewing. And what he was jealous of was being able to eat alone And yeah, it changed everything about the way that we do family meals, obviously discovering this. Um, but it started, it did start with jealousy and yet he didn't need the same accommodation as his brother. He needed a different one. And, um, so low demand parenting is really a method, not an outcome because the way that it looks is so individualized to that particular child and to the particular parent. Absolutely. That makes total sense. But I like that reframe of seeing jealousy as actually the ability, like a stepping stone for asking for help, basically. Yes. I think self-advocacy is a crucial set of skills for our children. And we talk about it all the time in our family. (laughs) So what does Um, that look like? Because I think that a lot of us as adults are still trying to learn how to self-advocate for ourselves. Um, Yeah. So my belief is that all behavior is communication. So sometimes it looks like crying, whining, banging on the floor, throwing things. That's (laughs) self-advocacy. Um, it is our children saying, this isn't working for me. There's a problem here. I need you to pay attention. I need you to help me fix this. And we've learned those scripts now so that there's a lot less of the what you might call like maladaptive behaviors um, and a lot more scripting of I need help. This isn't working for me. This is too hard um, because those things have power because I responded I think if, if 
if I didn't listen to what they were saying with their behaviors, they wouldn't have then eventually learned to use the words. Right. They They wouldn't have trusted your kind response back. Exactly. Yeah. It takes vulnerability and safety to be able to say something is too hard when, when people just assume that you can do it. Right. That's exactly right. It's, it's a real transformation to see a meltdown from this like really annoying thing that's happening or happening to you as a parent, right? That's how often we take meltdowns is that the child is doing something to us when really Mm -hmm. they're just a child that's having a hard time. Yes. And that it takes great vulnerability to say I'm having a hard time in that way. And that honoring their suffering and their vulnerability by responding with compassion and with the willingness to do something different. Like if you think about a classic judged encounter, maybe your child is screaming for Skittles in the target checkout line. Oh yeah. (laughs) It's everybody around is like spoiled child who is, who needs a firm hand and you grab the Skittles and you give them to them. And people are like, uh, you're giving in. <laughs> You've lost the power struggle. They're not going to respect them anymore. There's like a very. I know, clear the fact that we even use mentality. those words, right? To describe the situation. Exactly. But what if that child is over hungry and truly exhausted from their day that they are saying, I cannot wait another moment and this is all I can access. And you say, great, access it. I'm sorry I let it get to this point. That was on me. Next time, I'm going to make sure that you get the rest and the food that you need so we're not in this situation. It's a totally Totally softened moment. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're allowed. So many parents feel so guilty for doing that. They encase that interaction and all of this negative self-talk, like I'm not a good parent. I'm messing up Um, when it can be so connecting and so beautiful to meet your child's needs when they're presenting them. (laughs) Yeah, we really um, there's a lot of parenting, quote unquote, experts, right, that are about holding firm boundaries is the phrases they like to say Um, and and setting up structure. And I don't live my adult life structured. I didn't choose to go into the military. I didn't choose to go (laughs) into a very structured lifestyle. That's not the environment that I would ever choose for myself. So parenting from that way always felt like it was a like clothing I was trying on that didn't Mm -hmm. quite fit. That was scratchy. Did, Mm -hmm. did it feel that way to you? Yeah. I think I always thought that I would feel like a good mom if I got it all right. And discovering that I'm a good mom just as I am, that my definition of good parenthood is seeing, respecting, and loving the kids you have just as they are. And I can be that all the time, no matter what anybody else thinks of me. And unlocking that self-identity, it it helped me to shed all those poorly fitting clothes and to find what works for my skin and to stop looking around at what everybody else is doing and to tune into what my family needs, then I'm free. I uh, relate so much because so much of my early days of parenting felt like imposter syndrome as a mom. And it's taken me a while to figure out that that's the words that I wanted to put there. Like I was collecting all these experts, right? Trying to figure out how I could be a mom because motherhood isn't always intuitive when you're listening to voices that aren't compassionate in treating children like humans. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there's a lot of control involved that's kind of imported into motherhood that we're getting, we're feeling in control by controlling our children, but that doesn't create the kind of relationship that we want. And 
it can be so, um, I think that that heightens the sense of the imposter syndrome because it's like you have to do it more and more and more in order for it to work. Um, And on the other side of things, finding ease as a mother, learning to kind of sit down inside and be all right, just right where we are. And where we are has often been so far from the mainstream. So to be okay here, um, I think that it's a powerful witness. And the reason that I share what our daily life looks like is so that other people can get a sense of me too. I'm not the only one that there's so much shame and secrecy wrapped up in these decisions that we make and to be open and free with them, it really takes the shame away and says, Oh yeah. Oh, if, if you're doing that and you're a good mom, then maybe I'm okay doing what I'm doing. One of my favorite and most well-received um, pieces of my work is once a week, I chronicle our day and I do it on Instagram and call it my low demand day in the life and people love it. I mean, I love doing it. It's really fun. Um, but also it's, it's this big old love offering permission giving you're okay. Right. Just as you are. Um, if you like, we eat a lot more McDonald's than, than pre kids. Amanda would have ever <laughs> believed was fit within we the use a lot more it. electronics than wooden toys than pre Christy would have believed. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. And, you know, our fantasies of motherhood don't always pan out. And that's okay. And nor um, should they. <laughs> let's be present to the real life we're living and not the one that was sold to us. Yeah. Before we ever had our own kids. Absolutely. So if you were to coach a mom about one low demand, like how do you take putting on shoes and make that a low demand moment. Let's leave a mom with one walkthrough example. Okay, great. So let's say your child is, you say, all right, it's time to go put your shoes on and they don't do it. So then your next step isn't to get frustrated. It's to get curious. What part of going from where they are to where you want them to be, are they getting stuck on? Are they having a hard time transitioning from what they're currently doing into shoe mode? Like if you could get them to stop doing their Legos and come to where the shoes are, they have no problem getting the shoes on. Okay, great. Then you've unlocked the main problem. You bring the shoes to them and then they can, in between their Legos, get their shoes on. Let's say it's, the finding them that the shoes are always all over the house. And so they get stuck. Like, I don't know where they are. Then you step in and help them find their shoes. And then they can do the rest of the process. You find the part that's too hard, accommodate there, and then see what they can do. Then get proactive and find a system that you can put in place that helps to drop the demand that's too hard. So if it's that you always put the shoes in a particular spot so that they can go there and put them on, or one of the things, a system that works for us, my son can't do shoes at all. So we created a system called sock shoes. (laughs) And as long as he can put on socks, we go places and we call them sock shoes. And I'm prepared to advocate for why he puts their (laughs) shoes in this situation. And we drop the demand of shoes completely. Um, but the proactive part is your step two. The first is to be curious and to be a detective around demands. And your second part is to figure out how to create a system that the, we can let the things that are too hard go durably for the future. And it sounds like when you're getting curious, you have to be soft and really open minded to listen in- to all the challenges that might be there. Yes. The, the challenge might be something way different than you think it is. Like maybe it's not even about the shoes, but the shoes mean that you're leaving or something like that. Yeah. And recognize that there may be more difficulties than you originally thought that 
sometimes these small moments in our day turn into big meltdowns because they're actually really hard. And recognizing that not all kids are going to be able to get from, hey, put your shoes on to shoes on and waiting by the door. Um, or shoes just, on buckling your own car seat or yeah, just because you want them to. <laughs> doesn't that's doable. And um, that involves a little bit deeper compassion yeah. for the for the child and the struggle that they're happening having. Yeah. And if that happens, if if shoes lead to something bigger, make sure you go find Amanda on Instagram. Are you on TikTok too? Where else do you? Oh. Okay. I I'm follow on you on Facebook. Instagram. I don't know where people live on the internet besides <laughs> Instagram. Yeah, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram okay. at Amanda Amanda in both places. Okay. And so if you if you pause and discover and you feel like, oh my gosh, this is so much more. Make sure you follow Amanda. It is so life-giving and love-centered to see your day in the life. I love watching that in the stories when they pop up once a week. It's one of the reasons why I asked you to come on and have this conversation, because I knew that you are, and you completely are, exactly the right mom for your kids. And I love seeing how even, and what's obviously sensory unregulated moments and big emotions for you and your kids that there's there's a way to be connected through it and but that starts with with you and i love that that's what you lead with thank you i love that i appreciate it It, it's really validating to be seen that's something that's a core um, need that i have so i really appreciate that thank you Well, as you're doing this and giving so much with social media, how are you taking care of yourself? Every episode here on Keep Calm Mother On includes self-care. So what's a self-care moment for you right now, Amanda? Um, Drinking ice water through a straw is a (laughs) self-care moment for me. I use cold water after I endure uh, any meltdown, my own or my kids. I have a little routine that I gift myself with afterwards to say, I'm done. I survived. And it involves drinking cold water and grabbing a crunchy snack, like some carrots, something like real crunchy, and then doing a deep breath. And that is a part of my self-care. It's kind of a proactive demand drop that I would like just be able to go from fielding a meltdown to back to my regular life without kind of marker. So my self-care was to be proactive, to create a routine for myself. And so now every time I'm feeling a little overwhelmed or like I need some self-care, I go and make myself a big cup of water. And it just reminds me that I can take care of my needs and, um, and really like be mindful and savor that moment. That is absolutely super touching. Like, I love the fact that you pre-gamed the fact that you were going to face meltdowns of yours and other people's and that you came up with a strategy because that transition point from post meltdown is really sticky in my own lived experience. Absolutely. It's where I realized I was dissociating. It would, I would go into a fog for hours afterward and, and I just needed to be more alert to my life and wanted to be yeah. present to my life. Yeah, that wasn't how you wanted. Yeah, exactly. And now I have a very easily <laughs> uh, accessible tool that I can use for myself. Fantastic. Well, and how are you having fun as a family? I love this question because it's it's big for us. We do a lot of silliness and wrestling. So um, silliness would look like everybody grabbing a stick and running around the house pretending to be warriors or yeah. ninjas, <laughs> uh, varying levels of clothing being on or off. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> it's home. And it's wild. And we just let my little, my three guys run crazy. Um, then our other like family task together each day is to wrestle. So we don't do family meals and we don't get a lot of time to sit around and chat, but we all get on our big king size bed and the kids, it's kids against grownups and um, they always win. And it 
is a beautiful expression of our family togetherness time. And we end laughing and laying around together. And that's when talking and connecting happens after we've just had a massive game of wrestle. That is absolutely fantastic. Um, I love that. I love that that's your connection and joy moment. And and I don't know if you know this, but I've been reading also about roughhousing right now because there's a big new roughhousing book coming out and um, how roughhousing builds trust between parents mm-hmm. and kids, especially when kids can overpower the parents and the parents can handle it. Yes, it seems like it's an important part that they demolish us each time mm-hmm. and we get so into being you know destroyed and <laughs> and the kings of the castle and yeah um, parents and losing exciting. also doesn't make soft kids mm, no it builds their confidence mm-hmm. and connection yeah there's enough ways for them to be knocked down in life that yes yeah i can let them i can let them beat me in wrestling Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I want to say it one more time. You are exactly the right mom for your three boys. And I'm so glad to know you. I'm really glad you're here on earth at this same exact moment with me. You've made an impact on me. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much. You have always been exactly the right mom for your kids. I believe that. That's one of my core values. I'm so glad you're here having these conversations with us. I know you're not talking to us, but feel free to reach out to Amanda or myself. And please go check out her Low Demand Parenting Summit. It's at www.lowdemandparentingsummit.com. It's so important that you find resources so that you don't feel like a failure at parenting. Because I don't think you are. Parenting doesn't have to be this impossibly hard. I'll talk to you later. Thank you for being here. Thank you for loving your kids well. Have a great day. Well, actually, have a good enough day. Bye.